Okay, so this morning we are returning to our series. We pause for Good Friday. We pause for Easter. And so we concluded before Good Friday, 1 Thessalonians. And today we're opening up now 2 Thessalonians. So if you do have a Bible, turn to it. I'm using the NIV version today. And we are going to discover in the first 12 verses three important things. God's redemptive purpose for praise, God's redemptive purpose for persecution, God's redemptive purpose for prayer. If you ever wondered how God uses these things, the Holy Spirit through our faithful missionary men, to the pen of the Apostle Paul, gives us insight to what God is doing through those things. How he uses prayer, how he uses persecution, and how he uses praise to accomplish his will in our hearts and his will in the world. Now, if you've been with us, you understand that Paul and his companions now were on their second missionary journey as they went from Jerusalem, did a loop, and they're going out a little bit farther. They're bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to places that had not yet heard. And they went from city to city, from place to place, proclaiming God's word with boldness and clarity. In some places, there was this embrace of this gospel, and the church sprung up very readily and very easily. In other places, there was strong opposition to this message. And in other places, there were a mix of the two. And so the letters that we have in the New Testament, primarily from the Apostle Paul, were missionary letters to um, these young churches, encouraging them and instructing them and connecting them to the greater body of Christ and the greater work of God in the world. And so these things are a gift to us as brave and courageous men and women went forward with the greatest message of all time. And so Paul and Silas and Timothy were there in Thessalonica. It was a city. They suffered great persecution, so much so they had to leave. And some of the people from Thessalonica followed them to various places. So they had moved now to a city called Corinth, and they were curious and wondering and longing to hear news about this new church. And so they hadn't heard for quite some time, and so they ended up sending Timothy back. They said, Timothy, will you go back, and will you travel back to this place, and hear and bring report of how they are doing. So Timothy indeed did do so, went back, encouraged the believers, brought back um, uh, a message as to how they were doing, and Paul wrote back to them, and that's why we have 1 Thessalonians. Now, there was probably some misinformation about the day of the Lord, Jesus coming back. As we read both of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, there is a heavy emphasis on the return of Christ, which I'm grateful to have greater information. And so we're going to see that again in this letter, 2 Thessalonians. Okay? So Paul wrote them back and sent a letter to them. Now, more than likely, in a short time, they received another letter back asking more questions. And so Paul then wrote another response to them, and therefore we now have 2 Thessalonians. Paul and his companions, and we saw this in 1 Thessalonians, had great love and esteem. It wasn't there just going to this place to gather money, to, to check it off their list of places to go, and to move on. They had a heart connection with these people because God has a heart connection with his people, okay? It's not just love them and leave them, right? God gives us his spirit to be with us, and we see that in how he interacts with us. We see that how he interacts among us, and we see that in who God gives to us to help to mature us in the faith. And Paul and Silas and Timothy, by their actions and activity, showed that they were true, genuine workers of the word, true, genuine shepherds of the flock because of their continued consistency and connection with these new believers. And so they wrote to them and they prayed for them. And we'll see these things in this letter. 
So here we are, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, starting with verse 1. And this is the greeting that Paul typically gives out in each of his letters. He says, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessal- uh, Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you've read the New Testament, you'll see that greeting often. These two words, as he, uh, per se, extends his hand of blessing. And saying, grace and peace to you. Now, Paul could have wanted, and he does want, lots of things for them. He is primarily concerned about their love for one another and everyone else and their faith. And he doesn't say, faith and love to you. He says, grace and peace to you. You'll see this repeatedly in his letters. Which tells us that these two elements are of utmost importance to have active in our own heart and to have active in our congregation. Grace, right? It is by grace you have been saved through what? Faith, right? It's not something that we earn. It's not something that God says those people are better looking than others, even though we are better looking than others. Not that they're extra nice or extra special. (laughs) We are here solely and only by God's grace. Amazing, amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Saved a wretch like me. The world needs more grace. We don't live in a world that values grace much, right? We see grace as weakness. God sees our need of grace as a strength because He meets us in our weakness. When we are weak, He is strong. We need more grace in our congregation. We need more grace in our hearts. And through the grace of God, we have peace. Peace with God because of His grace. Peace with each other because of His grace. Peace within our own heart, with ourselves, because of his grace. Apostle Paul was indeed illuminated by the Holy Spirit, where again he extends his hands of blessing and a greeting, grace and peace be to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let that be sweet to you. May God minister that to your heart today. God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your peace. So after Paul gives this greeting with the, our, our brave missionary men, he turns to them, and this is our first main point. Understand God's redemptive purpose for praise. He turns to them, he greets them, extends a blessing of both grace and peace, and then encourages them and praises them. And we will see that through praise, it helps us to be encouraged and it helps us to be focused, right? Which also tells us that in this life, at times we are discouraged. And you can say amen to that, right? Life is hard, right? Living for Christ is not always easy, and sometimes we're just not feeling it, right? But God extends us praise for the things in which he's working in our heart, which is encourages us, and then it helps us to focus on what is most important. So he continues on in verse 3. We ought always to thank God for you, 
Thessalonians, for you, the church of God, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more. Here's the emphasis. Your faith is growing more and more. And the love all of you have for each other is increasing. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith and all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. So here we see some of God's redemptive purposes of praise. He is working and redeeming us and bringing glory to himself and bringing satisfaction to our hearts through praise. So praise gives glory to God. God is glorified when we are most satisfied in him. Praise of God. And so he opens up. We ought to always thank God for you, right? And so it makes my heart pause in saying, God, help me to see your working amongst us. Don't you want to see God work in your heart, in your home, in the community? What does it take to do that? It takes eyes that see. How do you get eyes that see God's working? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And God purifies us by his presence. God gives this purity to not just see what's on this plane. It takes no supernatural power to see problems. To see how it's hard. To see how life is difficult. It does take spiritual eyes to see where God is working. So if you want to see more of God's work in your heart, in your home, in your workplace, in this community, we need to ask him, God, will you purify my heart so I can see you clearly? What you're saying, what you're doing, where you're going, what you're about. So why Paul tells us to intentionally choose to focus on whatever is excellent, whichever is praiseworthy, whichever is true, whichever is noble, whichever is honorable, whichever is excellent. Think about such things. So if you have a hard time praising God, okay, I'm not going to ask you to gut it out. I'm going to ask you to pray for God's grace to see his work among us. That's a good prayer to make. God, what are you doing? What are you seeing? And once you behold him, once you see him, then we reflectively praise what is good. God, you were good in how you provided. God, you were good in how you mended. God, you were good how you made things work together for good. So my hope is that we as a community of faith would praise God in his glory because we can see God in his glory. And we need God's grace to do that. God, help us to be a people of praise. Help us to see you, God. Forgive us of our pride and our impurity. And he indeed will answer that prayer. Why? Because it's his will. If you want to pray a prayer that will be answered, pray that you will see God for who he is. He delights in showing himself to us. If you seek, you will find. But often we don't find because we're not seeking. Praise gives God glory. Second, praise provides us encouragement. 
encouragement to continue to do what we have been doing. We saw this in the first letter. He was primarily concerned about two things, that their faith would continue in perseverance through trials and that their love for one another would grow. This was his primary concern, that their faith would continue. And that's God's primary concern for us, that in the midst of difficulty and trials and misunderstandings and hardships and heartaches, will you continue to believe? This is the furnace in which faith is purified and seen as gold. Right? Encouragement to continue to do what they have been doing, that your faith is growing more and more, and the love you have for each other is increasing. He says, I praise you for that. I have learned as a leadership skill, as a parenting skill, as a skill of, of, of connecting in the world, that you praise what you want repeated. Right? You reward what you want repeated. And so I want to encourage you, practically speaking, that if you see something good, be it in your children, be it in your spouse, be it in someone that you work with, you reward what you want repeated. And so if you see something good, say, that's outstanding. Way to go. I saw when you took some time and you connected that person. I saw when you picked up the piece of trash. I saw when you went the extra mile. You do that. You reward this. It'll be repeated. This is good for us to know. So I want you, instead of focusing on catching people doing wrong, I want you to focus in on catching people doing right. Right? Seriously. And encourage one another. Right? Promotes hope in one another. Who doesn't want to be a part of a community of people who encourage one another? Hey, I saw what you did there. Well done. Hey, thank you for doing that. Hey, thank you. It's a beautiful thing. Reward what you want. Repeat it. And Paul says, listen, you guys continue to grow in your faith. Well done. Hey, listen, you guys continue to grow in love. Well done. And it encourages us. So praise gives God glory. Praise provides encouragement. Praise helps us to focus, right? To focus in what matters. Notice, he doesn't praise them for how much offering. Notice, he didn't praise them and saying, wow, you guys are really growing, how great, as in numbers, even though I imagine they were because they focused on the right things. Right? He says the things that need the most focus and the most worthy of praise are two things, faith and love provided by the grace and peace of God. That makes sense for us as a church to try to gauge how we're doing with our faith. Right? Do we persevere when it's difficult? Has this been a difficult year for anybody? <laughs> are you choosing to persevere? Those things can be measured by participation. They can be measured by things like giving. They can be measured by those things, but it's not those things that matter. It's that our faith perseveres and our love continues to grow. This is what matters to God, and this should matter to us as a church and as individuals. How is our faith? How is our love? Praise helps us to focus on what matters most. That's how God redeems praise. And you'll see praise throughout Scripture. Pay attention to it. Be encouraged by it and participate in those things that are worthy of praise. Lastly, under this point, praise builds others up. Did you catch that in the end of this verse? Therefore, among God's churches... We boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. Why is he saying this to the other places that are there? 
He says, hey, let me tell you about the gospel. And if their church is established, he says, hey, let me tell you what God is doing in this fellow, this city, okay, across the way called Thessal- Thessalonica. They are suffering, but they are continuing to persevere. You know what that does for me when I hear reports and when I, when I read uh, publications like Voice of the Martyrs? Have you heard of Voice of the Martyrs, by the way? Okay. You need to get this publication. It comes out every month, free of charge. You can go to their website, Voice of the Martyrs. And it talks about and tells us of, about how the gospel is going forward in some of the most difficult places on the earth. And when I read what other believers are going through, it gives me strength to continue going forward in my difficulties. That's a good amen spot right there. (laughs) We'll get trained in this, right? Come on. It helps, right? When I go on missions trips and go to places like Africa and India, when I hear about what's taking place in Myanmar and how they're going through difficulties and how they are persevering in the faith, If they are doing that under circumstances that are a whole lot more difficult than mine, I can continue in my circumstance, right? Doesn't that give you perspective? That's why it's good to read these things. That's why it's good to get our our hand, excuse me, our heads, move them up to see what's happening in the greater world, right? We have no excuse not to know what's going on in various places. But so often we have such a myopic view of life in our world because all we're focusing in in on is ourselves. Stop being so selfish. Dave, that wasn't very nice. I'm telling you, God is working throughout the world and he's inviting you to be a participant in it. And once you see what God is doing in various places you'll be encouraged, and we should praise those things. So God redeems praise, okay? This is how God redeems it, and we are to use praise as well, to provide encouragement, to help with focus, to help us to see what God is doing, and to give us strength to continue on. And so Paul does this through the power of the Holy Spirit and commends us to the same thing. So may we be a people who use praise to the glory of God. Now, second, we'll see how God uses persecution to understand God's redemptive purpose for persecution. And this is one that we have a hard time with. We can see clearly often how God uses praise. And we'll, the, the, the last point of how God uses prayer, we can understand those things. But persecution, God, what are you doing in this? Why are you allowing this? And why is these horrific things being um, um, perpetrated on this planet? We have a hard thing of, of reconciling a good and holy God with a fallen and horrible world at times. How do these things work? And how does God work and persecution, and pain, and suffering. We're going to see some of those things, and this passage will help us understand what God is doing. Starting with verse 5, let's continue going down. 2 Thessalonians 1, 5. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right. I'm going to pause right there. All this... Well, what is the all this that he's talking about? Well, what he just talked about. All of this, both your faith and your love continuing to grow, that and persecution. Remember, he's talking about these things growing in trial, in persecution. So both persecution and perseverance, all of that is evidence. That God's judgment is right. God's judgment, which tells us, number one, God knows what's happening on the world. Right? God sees. That's one of his names. The God who sees. He is not a blind and deaf 
and mute God. This is not a God who's on vacation, not a God who put things in, in motion and took off to some foreign distant planet because it was nicer. Okay. This is the God who knows. This is the God who sees. This is the God who is among us. God's judgment is right, which tells us that our moments matter and how we respond matters and that what we do matters because there will be a just judgment by a God who sees clearly. So all of these things, both perseverance and persecution, tells us that God's judgment is right and he continues to talk about it. And as a result of God's judgment and of this persecution and of your perseverance, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. Which your suffering. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you. And give relief to you who are troubled. And to us as well. God is just. That should both comfort you and scare you. God is just. So here is God's redemptive purposes for persecution. Number one, persecution reveals the truth about people. And number two, persecution reveals the truth about God. This is why and this is how God redeems persecution. Number one, it reveals the truth about people. Some will be persecuted and some will persecute. Some will cause trouble and some will be troubled. Some will show who they are by continuing to persevere in faith and love while others will reveal who they are by their lack of faith and love. Persecution reveals the truth about people. What will you do in which it is either faith or family? What are you going to choose? What are you going to choose between seeing God in his word or just continuing in your own ways? Teachers give tests to reveal the truth. Right? What's in them? Right? And the teachers are going, come on now, come on. Right? <laughs> How do you know what someone knows? Well, you give them a test. How do you know what's in them? By testing them to see. So God uses difficulties and trials and persecutions to reveal what is true about you. Will you persevere or will you crumble? Will you continue moving forward or will you stagnate or go backwards? This is why God uses these things. This is why God allows them. Two things. Number one, reveals the truth about those who persevere. Will you continue going forward? And in so doing, by the grace of God, it reveals and says, that person's worthy for the kingdom of God. Why? Because the grace of God is evident. Why? Because they continue to grow in their faith and love, even though it's hard. And second, it reveals the truth about those who are choosing to trouble. 
choosing to persecute, choosing to irritate, choosing intentionally to make matters worse and miserable for others. Two categories. Where are you going to land? And people will show who they are in time. In particular, what they do with power. Do they use it to bless or do they use it to bring glory and power or they, and abuse it on others? So why does God allow persecution? To reveal truth about us. Why does God allow persecution? To reveal the truth about him. God is just. There will be justice in the end. God guarantees it. God will deal with sin. God does not close his eyes to the evil in the world. And there is evil being perpetrated this day, this moment, in this community. God is not turning a blind eye. He's giving time for people to show who they are. He's extending grace. But there will be a time where the justice of God will be revealed. A God not angered by sin is not worthy to be worshipped. It grieves his heart. It angers him in a righteous way. When people are murdered, abandoned, abused, neglected, manipulated, God does not have a blind eye. He sees, he knows, he extends grace, and he will show his justice. Happens while we're here, but it will happen in the end. It reveals the truth about God. There will be a day of reckoning and a day of recognition. So we don't lose hope. We continue to do good. That's why Paul tells us in multiple places, you overcome evil with what? Good. Not more evil. Not more, you know, they're going to do this to me, I'm going to do it to them. You know what happens in this world? We just get more evil. And then not only are they going to be held account for their evil they do, we're going to be held account for the evil we do because evil is evil, period. Well, my evil is justified. <laughs> no, it's not. I've heard this stuff and we think this stuff. Well, they did that to me. I hear this from Christians. God says, overcome evil with good. And he connects this, Romans 12, with leave room for the wrath of God. Well, we don't like that about God. But if God didn't deal with sin, then nothing Matters. If God wasn't just, then nothing matters. Because you can do whatever you want and God doesn't care. And some people have spun the image of God to all he is, is love. We have to understand what love is. Love cares about justice. If I love my children, I will care if they are mistreated. And I will oppose those who mistreat them within my power. Do we love the love of God? Absolutely. And in his love, there is a deep and abiding perfection that sees and exhibits itself in both grace and justice. And so he encourages them and says, listen, God is working, Thessalonians. God is working, Rockfordians. 
and difficulty. Why? Showing the character. Your character is revealed through testing, both yours and everyone's. And God is just, and he will bring justice. Now he continues. He tells us when this will happen. Because we say, how long, God, how do you allow this child to be abused? And there are child abuse that is happening in our community today, right now. God, where were you? What are you doing? He knows, he sees, he gives opportunity, and he will bring justice. When? This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven. Notice how he's revealed in blazing fire and, and his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice how he's being revealed here. The first time he was revealed with trumpets and with angels, and it came with this little baby that was dependent on everyone, non-threatening this child. The meek and mild Jesus When Jesus comes again, notice the descriptors. He's coming in blazing fire. Fire in the Old Testament and the New Testament always was a sign of God's power, God's testing. You'll see that all over the Bible, revealing himself in fire. When he comes back, he's coming in blazing fire. You're not going to miss him. He's not coming coming back with these... um, Uh, You know, little depictions of these cherubims, these chubby babies with arrows and harps. Use one descriptor. He's coming back with powerful angels. You sketch that? What is he saying to us? This just God, when he returns, is coming in blazing fire. When he returns, is coming with powerful angels. What is he doing? Punish. We don't like that word. Who? You do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Which could mean those who know, but they don't follow. Has anyone ever in this place talked about the obedience of faith? Anyone say something like about that? The obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. Obeying the gospel is not just to know about God, it's to know God. A lot of churches in our community, a lot of people who know about God, but they don't know Him. And they don't follow Him. Do not obey the gospel. What will happen? They will be punished with everlasting destruction. Does not sound good. And shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. On the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you believed. God's testimony to us, to the apostles. When he comes again, it's going to be in a blazing fire. When he comes again, he's coming with powerful angels. When he comes again, he'll be marveled at by the nations. When he comes again, he will be glorified in his holy people, which includes us. He's coming for these things, but also to bring is justice. And the justice is being separated from God. The justice is being not included in his glory. The punishment is everlasting destruction. Seems a little harsh. Does the crime fit the punishment? This week, I read a sermon from a guy who described this, which helped me, and I'm going to share it to us because hopefully it'll help you. Okay. Told a story of a high school student that 
he was in class, and he decided to punch a fellow student, which merited this high school student detention. And then at detention, the student decides to punch a teacher. Boom. Now it wasn't detention, it was expulsion. Later on, the student decided to punch a police officer. That merited jail time. And a little bit later, he wanted to punch the president. Get this story. But thanks for dialing in. I like that. People who approach a president, no jail time. They're coming with the hurt that that person. Secret service takes them out. So here's the point. Same action. Same crime. but done to different people with a greater sense of severity, greater punishment because of the greatness of the person that they committed the crime against. When we sin, it's not just against each other. It's against the holy and glorious God. That's who we're ultimately saying, my way is better than your way. We may commit it against each other, but we're committing it against him. And so therefore, the punishment is rightly deserved because of the glory in whom we've offended. What helps us to endure persecution? Grace. What is God redeeming through it? Showing the truth about people. and Showing the truth about himself. And so we trust ourselves to God knowing that there will be a day of reckoning. The greatest tragedy in this is beings that are made by God, or made like God, who are made for God, should spend eternity without God. And we do that because we reject Him. And we rebel against Him. And because of this, we are banned from His presence. This should give us peace and it should break our heart. This should draw us closer to him. God, you are working. So if you say, God, where were you when? There will be a day of reckoning. Continue to do good. Continue to persevere. Continue to encourage one another as long as we have day and know that God will deal with it and it's his prerogative to judge and he will. That helps us. And Paul offers it to help them continue Thessalonians to persevere, continue Rockfordians to persevere. The God who sees, He is just, and He will glorify Himself, make it right in the end. So I want you to understand God's redemptive purpose for praise. I want you to understand God's redemptive purposes in persecution. And thirdly, I want you to understand God's redemptive purpose for prayer. Why do we pray? If God knows everything, why do we have to ask him anything? 
What is God doing through prayer? Why does he use this mechanism? And what does he do through it? And why is it important for us? Right. So Paul, in encouraging these believers... And telling them, hey, way to go, continue. Telling them, hey, I'm praising you and praising God. And telling them, hey, continue to persevere. This is what God is doing amongst you during this difficult time. And understand how God uses prayer in this process. With this in mind, verse 11. We continually pray for you. Giving themselves, devoted to prayer, giving themselves over to the word, giving themselves to these things. We continually pray for you that God may count you worthy of his calling. That's a good prayer. Praying that God will count us worthy of his calling, that we would be found in Christ, extended by the grace of Christ. This is a good prayer. This is, write these things down. If you're going to pray for people, pray this way. That God will count you worthy of his calling, and that by his power he may bring to fruition your every desire for godliness and every deed prompted by your faith. And I like that. We pray this. Why? So that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you. And you will be glorified in him. This is why we pray this. According to his grace, do you see that of the God and the Lord Jesus Christ? So prayer is a um, conduit in which grace is applied. Right? God's grace will be seen in you. So God's grace is seen. He redeems our prayer and uses it to apply grace to us. Number one, grace that you will persevere, right? We pray so that we'll have grace to persevere. He is the one that makes you worthy of his calling. Did you hear me? He is the one who does it. He is the author. He is the perfecter of our faith. We just join in what he's doing. He is the potter. We are the clay, who are you to resist what he's doing? He's conforming us into the image of his son. He's getting rid of the hardness of our heart. God, remove pride from my heart. When's the last time you prayed that? I prayed it this morning. I am prone to pride. Maybe you're not, but I am. God, forgive me of this. Mold me in this. Give me grace to persevere because you are the one who makes us worthy of your calling. So we constantly pray that God may count you worthy of his calling, right? I like this. So grace that you will persevere, that's why we pray. Grace that will be empowered. Here's a news flash. Not everything that you want and everything that you do is to God's glory. Amen, Pastor. Well, thank you. Yeah. It's not. So God, do this work. Help my prayers. And he says, and that, uh, this is the interesting line, that he, excuse me, that by his power, he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and every deed prompted by your faith. So we can pray, God, give me a desire for goodness. And God, because of faith, help me to step out. Faith often involves risk. Right? We're going to try this. We're going to go forward. Why? Because I believe, I trust. And out of the goodness of my heart, so we praise, may God bring to completion, bring to fruit your every desire for goodness and your deed prompted by your faith. So we pray that God's grace will empower our desires and our faith. That's good, redeeming purpose of prayer. That we'd persevere, that we'd be empowered. Grace that Jesus will be glorified in you, and grace that you will be glorified in him. Don't you like that? Right? At the end of the day, it's not about your goodness, it's about God's glory. Right? And his goodness. Right? That we may become less so that he may become more. Yeah. 
Help us to die to ourselves, so that in so doing, God would live in us. The problem with Dave is there's too much Dave inside of Dave. That's my biggest problem. It's not what happens out here. It happens in here. It's your biggest problem as well. Grace that Jesus will be glorified in you. And if Christ is glorified in us, we will be glorified in him. Paul knew that. The Holy Spirit knows that. And extends it to us. So God redeems praise. He uses it to encourage us, to keep us focused, strengthen us. God redeems persecution because through it we are seen for who we are. People, all people, good or bad, are seen. If they're troubled or troubling, they're seen. God uses it to reveal the truth about people, reveals to show truth about himself, that he is just and he is powerful and he is gracious And he deals with sin. God redeems prayer. He uses it to give us grace to persevere. He uses it to give us grace to be empowered. He uses it to glorify himself. And so we pray that we are glorified in him. What a way to start this second letter. And so that's our prayer here. People will say, God is among you. Why? Because he's changing hearts. <laughs> Not because how cool our building is. Not because how great the worship is. Not because, oh, what a good word. <laughs> because God transforms our hearts. That's evidence in, in us, among us, and through us the nations so I'm going to pray for us Dan Comer one of our shepherds is going to lead us in communion where we celebrate our our um, faith so we're going to pray before we go into communion so God here we are this day in this building various places around this country and other places in the world God, I ask that what was said and shared this morning that's of you would sink deep into our hearts. And then you would use it. Whatever's said that isn't of you, God, we forget that stuff. But we would take these things to our heart. Help us to meditate. Help us to think. Help us to support, uh, explore. God, help us to see these things. And God, as we join together, in our time of communion, we recognize that we're joining with believers all over the world. We're joining with our friends and relatives in Myanmar who are suffering in other places. We renew our commitment to you today. I ask that our faith would grow. I ask that our love would grow. So that you would be glorified. In rock. our region until we see you coming in blazing fire. Thank you for your grace and peace and for your presence among us. In Jesus' name, amen.